Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, New York Community Bank, m and Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, AmTrust Title, Aerial Property Advisors, Dime Community Bank. Additional funding has been provided by AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Real Estate Organization, Handrow Properties, Hodges Ward Elliott, Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Meringhoff Family Foundation, the Moynian Organization, Moynian Capital Partners, and these friends. Healthcare. Each and every day you walk around the city of New York, you see buses with advertisements, you read different things, you hear on the radio, TV, the internet, healthcare, healthcare, hospitals, everything. So today I've assembled the leaders of leading healthcare institutions to talk about what's happening and their views of the market. My guests they include Dr. Laura Faris, the New York Presbyterian, Dr. Andy Brotman, NYU Langone Health, and last but not least, Dr. Andy Racine at the Montefiore Health System. So what's the biggest challenge that we have today affecting the hospitals and the healthcare system? Each of our health systems, and certainly New York Presbyterian, very focused on being able to care for New Yorkers who have Medicaid or who have no insurance, as well as those who have commercial insurance. But and I how think we all, do that but all together. three of you are doing that also. I mean, oh, clearly. Have, we're clearly all doing it. We are, and the challenges get more and more difficult as the treatments evolve. So, uh, for example, there are a whole new set of uh, drugs which treat cancer and other things, uh, a whole new set of genetic tests which do that, and you have, uh, like, uh, Jimmy Carter being cured, essentially, of uh, metastatic melanoma three years ago. and. Uh, uh, these drugs cost a lot, and uh, each insurer uh, has a different policy as to how they're handled, not to mention all the medical devices that are now available. And these things improve outcomes for certain people. Uh, we're not yet evolved enough to know who they help and who they don't help. Hopefully that will be an next iteration. But in the meantime, and in the absence of any national policy, we're sort of forced on a micro level to figure out um, uh, when but, do you but your give, patients, when don't you give. Your patients or the consumer today uh, demand it. Is demanding. Okay? They demand it. They're watching that commercial with the Keytruda. They they're demand wa it. They're reading about a proton center. That's they have correct. no idea what a proton center is. They say, oh, there's a proton center. They're hearing about telemedicine. They're hearing about stroke programs. And, and you know, the, what happens with you know, when you had print media, that was one thing. Today with the internet and with all the, of the media over there, there's so much to read. So when somebody has a condition, they start searching it out and then they, 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 
massive, they, they figure out where they go. I mean, you can see it in some of the commercials by that Cancer Care Center of America, who has no affiliation with any of the medical centers over here, but they're going to the consumer. They're saying they're providing better care. They're providing different types of care. But let's talk about what's happening specifically with your institutions. You are opening up numerous ambulatory care centers, 41st Street, uh, Lower East Side and Essex Greens, Midtown. What's happening with that and a new hospital? In, in general, uh, I've always called our system an ambulatory care system with a few hospitals um, uh, because uh, the vast majority of care is done in the ambulatory sphere. You need to be closer to where people are and so therefore the proliferation of uh, facilities, physicians, uh, allied health professionals in the communities, in the neighborhoods is the uh, uh, major part of growth and the amount of people who come into the hospital are less, the lengths of stays are, are fewer, the technology is higher, so I think in general, and others others are doing the same thing, but they'll speak for themselves, uh, uh, most of healthcare is, is in the uh, ambulatory arena and we feel like we need to be there. Are you seeing that, Laura? Absolutely, and my background is as a surgeon, and now the numbers of things that we can do in the outpatient space that used to be inpatient is really quite striking. So for New York Presbyterian, we just recently, this week, opened up our David Koch Center, and we've really focused it on transforming care. So it's high tech and some equipment there that frankly is first in the world, but also high touch because that's what our patients want, and it's all focused now on that ambulatory so what arena. So what did you replace f with the hospital with this new building? Well, we've actually expanded, is what we really did now, and part of it is that we're still gonna have things in the hospital. We all have that setting where there's certain things that even today require an inpatient stay, but more and more you're seeing that shift to the outpatient, so if we can do that safely, and of course, that's what our academic medical centers are well positioned to do, looking at the technology, really focusing on our patients, pushing that envelope because we want to give patients not just the right level of care, but we want to also think about the cost of care and having someone out of the hospital is good for the system as a whole. You know, with, with regard to that, the subject of efficiency, hospitals at one time were a five-day operation, okay? It was Monday to Friday, I know a couple of years ago you've implemented the sixth and the seventh day. And you're saying, I got the physical facility over here. People want to have the availability to come on different days of the week, and I might as well use the space. It's like the retailer saying, I, got, I pay for the rent. Give me the opportunity. Are you guys doing that? Yes, I think we all are, and I have to agree with what um, Dr. Fries and Dr. Uh, Brotman have said up until now. The issue for the healthcare sector in general is fairly straightforward. We spend 19% of the GDP in this country on health care, which is far and away more than what other, uh, other countries spend, and we get less for it with regard to outcomes. If you look at what that's about, it turns out that it's not as though people in the United States actually use more health care than other countries. In many ways, they use less. The problem is price. We charge more for everything that we do relative to other places. Physicians make more money. Pharmaceutical companies charge more. Hospitalizations are more expensive. We may charge more for the same technology that they do elsewhere, but we get more money for it. So if you're going to try and change that dynamic, there are a couple of ways to do it. One is, as Dr. Fries was pointing out, you can shift where the care occurs because there are places where you can deliver the same care for less cost. And that's uh, a, a trend that's happening in all our systems. The second thing that, um, though, you can do is you can th think about how it is that you align the incentives so that the people that are making the decisions as to what a patient needs, meaning the patient and the physician, have the same financial risk as the people that are paying for it, which is what risk-based contracting is about. So I know that we're all doing that to some extent or another. I know Montefiore, this has been something that we've been involved with for 20 years. This idea that you can have that 
that decision about where the care is taking place made by the same people that have financial risk in that decision. But isn't it also true that you want to keep people healthy? If you keep, well, that's, them, if you keep them healthier, you, you're going to cut your, your expenses down. That's exactly right. So in addition to trying to shift where the care is taking place, you want to shift along the trajectory of people's um, health uh, sort of experience over time. You want to shift to treating people or getting to people earlier. Right? So before they develop uh, the symptoms of chronic illness, you want to be able to prevent that. Or if they've already developed it, you want to mitigate the, uh, the circumstances of it. And what that means is concentrating more on ambulatory care, getting to people where they live, addressing the social determinants of health, much more than just what medicines they're taking, and trying to keep them healthy so that they don't end up developing these chronic illnesses that are extremely expensive. So I think that's spot on. But we have a fundamental problem, which is that the majority of our health care is paid for by government payers, Medicaid and Medicare. And uh, there is a dramatic difference in reimbursement between inpatient and ambulatory on those payers. Dramatic. To the point where if somebody has a one-day hospitalization, you may get $5,000. If you have a 12-hour hospitalization that does the same thing, you may get 400 uh, and part of the challenge of being able, you can do it cheaper in the ambulatory sector, but probably not 90% cheaper. So the issue is how do, you, how do you have a payer mechanism that is able to respond to that? My concern is the answer to that is, well, take full risk. Have everybody take full risk. I personally think that's a pretty big jump, particularly given the state of infrastructure and affairs of the various insurance companies. So we're in a funny situation where we're moving things to the ambulatory sector, but if you're predominantly paid by government payers, it's harder to make. Well, it, look, each of us has a significant share of government pay patients. New York Presbyterian has 35% of our patients are covered by Medicaid. That's why the onus, completely agree with, with all of your comments, the onus is on us, are on the advocacy to really make the case. So let's look at something like telemedicine. We gotta make sure that the promise of telemedicine applies to those who are commercially insured as, the, as well as those who have government insurance. And it means making the case so wait, how for do you framing get, why. Okay, how do you get the Medicaid patient to be attuned to telemedicine. So we're absolutely I think working that's a, on that's that. A big, that's a big difficulty, okay? No, it's not. I, There's no? no different. No, no, no. Really? No, no, no. I mean, everybody has a smartphone. Everybody has No, a no, but the question is, how do you get the patient, okay? You know, you're an orthopedic surgeon. You're an internist. You're a psychiatrist. A lot of your type of work today is more geared to, tele to telemedicine, mm -hmm. okay? A lot of it's... Right. It's more appropriate because they, but, they don't have to travel. But as long as we have the infrastructure in place, okay, so everybody's walking around with a smartphone, or we can get people to places where they can get to a device, a kiosk, or something else. Now, we do have to think about some of these things. In the New York City Housing Authority, this concept of broadband, right, so making sure that we have enough, that we can cover people, that's where our advocacy comes in. And your Presbyterian has been doing a lot to say we have to think about this. It's good for our patients. It's good for us as a society. And we do have to rethink how these programs are all coming together. And the regulatory issues, because even in telehealth, the regulations for Medicare and Medicaid are fundamentally different. But, than the but didn't they recently come out with different regulations for Medicare and uh, telehealth? Uh, relaxing them somewhat, but not to the same degree Right, and this, is all, and this is all a work in progress. I mean, we, what we talk about now is not where we were six months or a year ago. It's not where we're going to be two years from now. Whether it's with regard to the payer system that uh, Dr. Bratman was referring to or some of the telemedicine regulations that you're referring to, we're figuring this out as we go along. This is a brave new world. We're at the frontier of a lot of these things. So there's no reason to believe that we have it right yet, but we're going to. And the only other thing that I would say with regard to full risk, which is what Dr. Bratman was referring to here, just like everything else, it's a question of the price, right? 
Right. Insurance if you companies if you know how to take full risk. So Why? Because they know how to price their product. So what, it's an actuarial calculation. So what happens made. now with the insurance companies buying companies? Okay, the mergers and all the acquisitions. Okay, and the, and the discussion of Amazon getting involved with Walmart and Berkshire Hathaway. This is. It's all very, it's all fascinating, and I think it's impossible to figure out how this is going to come out. People speculate about what the strategy is uh, for all these folks. Well, the insurers will hook up with, uh, with uh, uh, a, a pharmaceutical chain and do the care in the clinics. E everybody is uh, uh, trying to leverage uh, say, across a series of. Right. Uh, across a series of services. And I would say something, one other thing about this, a lot of people have been talking about the kind of mergers that you're referring to, and there are a lot of folks in the technology sector that think they can do healthcare and think they can do it well. And to quote a public official, healthcare is more complicated than people think. And I, for one, am not that concerned with many of the entries that you're talking about. Because I know what we do day to day in order to try and run large healthcare systems. It is very, very complicated. And this is, and we're talking about folks who've been doing this for their entire careers. You cannot simply think there's a technological fix to this. Technology is a tool that needs to be applied in order to deliver excellent health care to broad populations of people. But it's the delivery of the care that's really the complicated So part. one of the things that we, we really got to focus on, though, is that they are going to be disruptors, all of these different types of companies coming in and the mergers. And I think, as you said, we don't know what this is all going to look like, and everybody thinks they know how to do it. In the meantime, there is a lot of focus in our systems, and I'd say New York Presbyterian is spending a lot of time saying, how are we demonstrating what it is that we do, right? So part of it is to come back and say, here's how you, the patient, you, the payer, you, the government, are getting value for what we're delivering. So we do have to shift. We do have to move. We do have to be cognizant of all of these trends as they're coming in. We can't obviously have our heads in the sand, and that's why all of our systems are focused on you know, technology. You know, when you talk about situations five years ago, you know, it's, we didn't have this many urgent care centers. We really didn't have tele, telehealth over here. So we have new trends. Part of it is to get the consumer to be educated about these new products, okay? You know, people thought about if they were sick, they were in the hospital, okay? As you said, it's ambulatory care. They may be there yeah. for... And you, and you don't always know what the outcome of those were. Urgent care centers were originally pitched as a way to avoid emergency room 100%. visits. That has been fundamentally not true. Uh, uh, emergency room visits haven't budged. Um, uh, maybe some visits to the doctor's office have decreased and been replaced by urgent care, but the vast majority of those visits are new activities which previously didn't happen. So you're not sure when you put something into place what the implication of that is going to be. You can in all good faith say, this is a great idea and uh, we think it'll save money and lo and behold you find out that that's not exactly what happened. So you have to stay on it the whole time and evaluate it at every step of the way in order to uh, have a strategy, uh, as, as was stated, that, that gets updated every week rather than every I five I mean, years. even if you follow the urgent care and different concepts, CVS, who's the, one of the largest pharmaceutical chains in the, in, the, in the country, basically doesn't have urgent care. They have a minute clinic. They don't yeah. have a physician. They have an allied healthcare professional doing the work. And uh, it may be for certain kinds of things that's particularly appropriate. I mean, we have, we have an arrangement with CVS, and there are patients in our system that go there for very minor things that's very convenient for them. And, that's and it's also them. cheaper, and it's, it's, it's efficient. That's right. And the person's deductible, is, it, it changes over there. Absolutely. So we've, we've gone in a slightly different direction. New York Presbyterian and Walgreens have now partnered on a different model that focuses on telemedicine. So there isn't someone positioned in the, in the Walgreens but there's itself. But there's a camera in the there's a There's a kiosk that gets you to, it actually gets you to one of our emergency medicine physicians who is actually stationed at the hospital. And the concept there was, there are a lot of things that we'd say, you're talking to someone, we can keep you out of, the, out of the hospital. But there are other things where 
once they start that, that interaction, the response has been, okay, now you need to get to that hospital. And we've sometimes had to dispatch an ambulance to go get the patient. So we see urgent care as that middle ground that doesn't really solve some of the challenges and certainly doesn't connect you in the same way as we see to yeah. our healthcare system. We agree with that. At, at NYU Langone, we've done the same thing. Our virtual urgent care is all board certified emergency doctors who are the people behind mm -hmm. the cameras and it's not with, a, with an intermediary. And uh, we'll see uh, whether the use of the urgent care centers is prim primarily because of the convenience and the convenience of telehealth can be just as convenient or more convenient but than going to a place. But many patients are even we'll using see. telehealth for post-operative cir cir circumstances. As are we. Okay, uh, no, I'm talking yeah. about you. Yeah, okay? as in, are in we. In many cases and over there. In some cases uh, where you uh, have previously asked people to come to the hospital and it really has no value added, telehealth can be a terrific way to say, let me take a look at your wound after this uh, surgery. If the technology is good enough, you don't need to come in. We'll, we'll, we'll check it what that What about way. expansion? I mean, you've expanded, you have 11 hospitals. You, you've expanded basically you've only really expanded in Brooklyn hospital-wise. Okay? Long Island. But, but you've, Long Island. Uh, Long Island with Winthrop over yeah. the, and Brooklyn. But you've expanded enormously in ambulatory, ambulatory. care centers, yeah. okay? Have you expanded heavily in ambulatory care? I know you've expanded into Westchester and Hudson County. Right, and we have arrangements now with Crystal Run, which is a large ambulatory practice in Orange County and in Rockland. Um, and we have working relationships with other large um, ambulatory sectors out there. And we have our own 21, you know, uh, site ambulatory network that takes care of 300,000 patients in the Bronson Lower Westchester. That's something that was established some time ago. Yeah, you know, I, too many people today are seeing advertisements, forget the drug companies, they're seeing Ancestry.com and the, you know, the, the gene, genetic gene testing. Okay, which is not always the best of situations. And, you know, in the same manner that many years ago when people would go th for the full body scans and they'd have false positives, it would have an effect. What effect are you seeing this 21 and Me and all of these genetic testing having an effect on your business, on the hospital? I, th I think it's a huge effect, uh, predominantly now in the cancer world, but uh, soon to be more. The truth of the matter is, is the technology is far ahead of actionable uh, uh, interventions that can take place when people get large panels of genes, and there are places that really do large panels of genes on every patient. There are only uh, a, a subset, probably less than 20, uh, where you actually have enough data to do anything about it, but they're getting it anyway, and it's a bit of an arms race. And as I said before, the issue is, can you really identify who will respond to what treatment with some of these tests? That would be something to add. But now, a lot of people want the test because they I mean, about with it. regard to that, one of the tests that I know, a lot of people have been taking the BRCA test. And once they find out they, they have the BRCA gene, they, 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 they're reading from the internet or they're hearing from friends, you have to have your breast removed. You have to have this type of surgery. You know, it's, I don't want to say it's false positive, but there's more than that genetic testing to make a decision of what you have to do for the patient. Well, here's where our, again, the academic medical center concept is so critical. So for us, our two medical school partners, Columbia and Weill Cornell, we're doing a lot now just on this focus on precision medicine because it's not just about the test. Right. It's about putting it all together and saying this is what will really make a difference. So there's family history, there's your own personal medical history, and then there's testing that we can actually do for you on your type of disease. So as we think about this concept of precision medicine, we're gonna advance it significantly, and that's why an academic medical center, the hospital and the medical school complex, is really so well positioned for patients to advance that science. Right, but all three I agree. of you have the academic and we want, yeah. we, we want to great. do the right thing, uh, but but as we speak, a lot of those answers aren't known. And if people are in desperate straits, they want whatever they think gives them any chance. And it's a dilemma, it's an ethical dilemma, it's something that people at our various systems deal with every single day. 
Mm -hmm. What about more consolidations? Do we see any more consolidations in the hospital arena, the healthcare arena? I think there's been a lot of change in the New York City region market in that regard. There's been a lot of consolidation that's already taken place. I think the vast majority of it has been completed, but there's always going to be um, I mean, I mean, there's going to be a void in Lower Manhattan right now with Beth Israel closing their hospital, which is probably going to have an increase effect on NYU Langone and on down, um, New York, uh, New York Lower, Manhattan. Manhattan. Lower Manhattan over there. The same situation happened when St. Vinny's closed. There's a void of handling who's taking care of that situation. But Michael, you know, if I could raise one important point that I know all of our systems are also focused on, and that is the important, the importance of the city system, right? Health and Hospitals Corporation. It is really important for us to recognize that it's in everyone's interest and certainly the citizens of New York for that to remain as strong as possible. And so you see a lot of our, a lot of time is spent with our health systems working all together to make sure that we're thinking about this because um, there aren't that many more consolidations to take place and we really now are starting to see how this comes together and the city hospital system is critically important for the health of New Yorkers. Yeah, I mean, we're the biggest affiliate to HHC, to health and hospitals of, of, of anyone, and it is important. But I challenge you a little bit on the word void. It's not necessarily a void if a hospital isn't there. It's a void if health care isn't there. And there are different kinds of health care, mm -hmm. um, uh, and that has to be taken care of. Uh, uh, you know, frankly, every hospital isn't needed. Every office isn't needed. Uh, you know, our job is to try to serve uh, you the know, let, Let's serve be the realistic. Community. We have wonderful hospitals. All three of you have, each one of you have wonderful cancer centers. Okay, there are, how many cancer centers do we need over here? And then, you know, you're getting involved with the Proton Center, okay? Very expensive proposition to build. I mean, it's $40 million at least. Okay, and as we were saying, the insurance companies will determine who they want to take care of it. The There'll only be one, though. What? There'll only be one. There will only be one in New York City. Right. Okay. Eight but, and a half million people. Right. And if you're talking about the region, a lot more. No question. But in New Jersey, they also have a proton center. Okay, so it's a different idea. I think healthcare has evolved. Okay, over the years that I've been doing the show, I've had many people on, and the discussions, if we went back on the shows, would be different. Okay, the, the magnitude of ambulatory care, the, the situation with regard to advertising, uh, the world has changed. Well, one of the big differences, though, is that, uh, you know, we as a country are based on competition and economics and tend to shy away from making broad, centralized planning decisions as some uh, other countries do. And so this process of how is it going to shake out is endemic to our society. We will not have the political will to say, okay, this commission will decide what the plan is for the, for the greater New York area. It just doesn't but, work. But you know, in, in conclusion, you know, people talk, you go to Canada, you have to wait months for an appointment. You go to England, you have to, here you see somebody quicker, okay, it's more expensive and you're getting quality treatment. And I think the best treatment probably, I'm, you know, I'm biased, it comes from the New York region that all three of you, and I'd like to thank Laura Faris, Andy Brotman, Andy Racine, and until we get together again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.